Hello from the land of TV. This is King Cool. This is my list of the top 10 best and worst movies of 2014. Yes, I know it's February. Thank you for noticing. But I got it before the Oscars. Maybe. Anyway, here are my runner-ups. I honestly hope that the Box Trolls does take um, the animated feature nomination that it got. Dawn of the Planet of the Apes is still like better than it uh, has any right to be. But... On my script, I wrote down Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and I think that shows part of the problem is that they're good, but they're not really special in any way. The Veronica Mars movie I thought was a lot of fun, and I really would love to see the Muppets return to television someday, almost as an antidote to the uh, super cheaply produced um, reality television that we're getting lately. I honestly think these things are sort of cyclical, where um, because of all the reality show stuff, we now have lots of extremely elaborate television that's being made. Um, and I don't see why the Muppets can't come back, too. A Most Wanted Man is pretty good. I'm still not sure. Maybe I should have put it on the list somewhere, but I don't know where it would have gone. And, yep, with the Pirate Fairy, I'm 5 for 5 for all the um, Tinkerbell movies, and I am legitimately looking forward to the sixth one coming out in March, I believe it is. Number 10. The Grand Budapest Hotel. Wes Anderson doesn't always work for me. For instance, I thought Moonrise Kingdom was impenetrable, but I did like uh, Bottle Rocket and The Darjeeling Limited. Here, Sir Sir Ronan plays a character whom people remark has a birthmark that looks like Mexico on her face. But the birthmark looks exactly like Mexico, like Baja California and everything. It looks like a stencil. I hate that kind of crap in movies like this almost every other time, but not here. Here I liked it. Ray finds immaculate and utterly devoted concierge, just like the deliberate use of miniatures, to me, represents the care and optimism of times past, remembered with deep melancholy as the years move on. Number 9. The Rover After an unspecified apocalypse, Guy Pierce gets his car stolen, and he takes an abandoned and disabled man along with him to get his car back. Now, this movie almost lost me right away, because... The way he gets his car stolen is, there's a minor accident, and they take his car. But then, Guy Pierce gets their car unstuck, and he chases them in the car that they left behind. This entire scenario did not have to happen this way, but it did. And then you have to wonder, Guy, why do you need your car back? What, did you just fill up the tank? And yeah, there is a reason, and the reason isn't just the principle of a thing, or revenge, or anything like that. This is a movie that almost smothers you with dread and tension as you watch and wonder what will happen and what will this ruthless man do to get his car back. Number 8. Edge of Tomorrow. Shaky Cam has become a shorthand for let's not shoot this action properly, or sometimes, more regrettably, shaking the camera around is action. Good directors, well most of the time, Doug Lyman did also direct Jumper after all, Good directors don't use it as a way to cheap out on action. This is a rare combination of great action with an interesting and well-presented story made better by a relevatory performance from Emily Blunt. I'd love to see her star in her own action movie. And Tom Cruise, too. I tell you, he's going to be big someday. Number 7. The Drop I don't typically like movies about the mob, but this one was different because it wasn't about making stupid excuses for horrible crimes to support lives of unimaginable extravagance. This one's about the low man on the totem pole. Imagine being the guy who runs one of the bars where the mob does their money drops. Not only are you in the mob, and all the stuff that comes with that, you also gotta run a bar. And the plot goes into motion over a lousy $5,000, I think it was. Enough to throw any regular Joe's life into chaos, but a drop in the bucket for the mob. Tom Hardy gives a great performance as the main character. There's a reason why tough guy is almost always used as a pejorative now. The guys who really are tough aren't the ones who talk about it all the time. They sit quietly until they're needed, sometimes waiting until the very last second. Number six, John Wick. Okay, The Matrix is my favorite movie of all time. So a movie starring Keanu Reeves and the first movie directed by the stunt coordinator of The Matrix movies and many other pictures, Chad Stahelski. Yeah, this one was designed specifically for me. Your mileage may vary, but I loved this film. Edge of Tomorrow was the best at the more chaotic style of action, but John Wick is like a ballet with guns and hitmen, with absolutely thrilling fight scenes with clear choreography, nice long camera pants, all set in a fascinating world where assassins have a hidden support network and even their own fiat currency. How many movies leave you wanting a sequel immediately after it's done, even if the main character does not come back? Number 5. 22 Jump Street. 
I am as shocked as you are. I'm so tired of almost all the post-hangover R-rated comedies lately, but 22 Jump Street is legitimately hilarious. We all knew Jonah Hill was funny, most of the time. <clears throat> Night at the Museum, too. But who knew Channing Tatum was a natural-born comedic talent? Some guys get all the breaks. They even find a way to sort of make jokes about the silliness of making a sequel without exactly breaking the fourth wall. I want to give special attention to the supporting player Jillian Bell, who almost steals every scene she's in. She's great. Number four, chef. A more obvious metaphor you could hardly ask for. John Favreau is a chef who rankles at the controls imposed upon him by the guy who owns the restaurant, so he quits and tries to rediscover his passion for cooking. It's so obviously a metaphor for making movies in the studio system, probably specifically working under Marvel to make the first two Iron Man movies. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, the movie ends with a caveat, although this is based on true events, it's a work of fiction that you normally see at the end of biopics, but I'm not positive. And yeah, the story itself about the divorced man and his slightly distant but far more tech-savvy son, we've seen this, but it works here. Maybe it's just John Favreau's charisma or his comedy and improv sensibilities that serve him well here, but what should have been self-indulgent and awful is charming. And maybe a bit self-indulgent. You know how good this movie is? You know how some movies have a critic character who isn't just a critic, but they are deliberately malevolent? Like Lady in the Water or, oh, I don't know, Birdman, whose critic character is basically Lord Zed? In Chef... They somehow avoid this pitfall with the critic character, mostly because the critic isn't actually supposed to be the antagonist. He doesn't actually have it out for Jon Favreau, and he actually disappears for a huge chunk of the movie. Number three, Guardians of the Galaxy. Speaking of Marvel, it seems like every time Marvel comes out with a new one, well, like, this is the one that could go wrong, right? Guardians of the Galaxy is the most obscure Marvel property they might try to adapt into a movie until they make their Great Lakes Avengers. But did it work? Yeah. This is a very successful combination of blockbuster action and comedy. I knew this movie had me when I saw the five protagonists sitting in a circle, arguing around one another in different ways, taking different sides in their own way. It's a lot of fun. Number two, Captain America the Winter Soldier. Yeah, more Marvel. I'm giving Captain America the edge here, mostly because I think the message about patriotism and fear and government power is more important. It's not as funny as Guardians. And yes, they're going to need to check out the Marvel formula pretty soon here. Hopefully Ant-Man will. I bet someone out there is just waiting to say, well, how come you complained about the formula in Star Trek but not here? Well, if formula is executed well, it can work. Star Trek wasn't. Captain America and most of the rest of the Marvel movies do work. Number one, the Lego movie. Yes, I loved this movie from the second Wildstyle was looking at the pieces that made up her Lego world and saw numbers. And I knew right then, those are the part numbers from the catalog if you wanted to buy individual pieces through mail order. I was already partially on board when I saw Good Cop, Bad Cop in the trailer. The Lego movie is energetic and hilarious and beautiful and colorful from start to finish. And by a country mile, not just my favorite movie of this year, but it's now among my favorite movies of all. It's a movie that makes me happy just to think about. I haven't seen a movie that made me do that in years. Not Pacific Rim, not Inception, not even my beloved Frozen. If you have ever loved Lego, watch the Lego movie. It was the best movie I saw last year, and probably the best kids film in a decade. Which is why it's a total crock it wasn't nominated for an Oscar. Ay. Before we move on to our worst list, here's the uh, runner-ups for the worst movie of the year. I, Frankenstein is just sort of a bore, sadly. It, it would never have made the list. It just isn't that great. Same with Jack Ryan Shadow Recruit. How to Train a Dragon frustrated me a lot. Um, I know everyone else likes it, but I've just never understood it. And I even like the first one. And Mr. Peabody and Sherman is troublesome because the first 20 minutes of it are pretty good, where it actually resembles the original cartoons. And then they introduced Penny. And Penny is a character of such shocking negativity that she pretty much ruined the rest of the movie for me. Number 10. Dracula Untold. This one just barely makes it on the list. And you know what? It's boring, so I want to talk about something else. Let's go back to How to Train a Dragon 2. How to Train a Dragon 2 sucks. I can't quite say it's worse than Dracula Untold, but it's really irritating. There's a few bits I liked, but the movie lost me when they pulled out this old chestnut. Please put your hands together and welcome the inanimate players! Uh, I'm gonna go all fine. I have to go find you know, my father or my older brother or my son. Oh, the thing, I have to go exploring the world or whatever. You know, maybe what you're looking for isn't out there. Maybe what you're looking for is in here. Oh, if it's so good, you grow hands. My real problem is, 
I don't mind if Hiccup is basically a modern kid who doesn't talk like his warlike elders, but his friend, his asinine, irritating friends, who all come in out of nowhere just to make a joke. Do you guys remember Epic from 2013? And how the plot couldn't go anywhere without the slugs making some stupid joke? No shell over her, baby. That's what his friends are like in the movie. They just drag everything down and put a wrench right in the gears and make everything stop. And you know what? Big Hero 6 has a similar problem. Well, the periphery characters just sort of pop up and have a joke out of nowhere. I heard some people say Big Hero 6 was good at characterizing without telling you stuff. And my response to that was, yeah, maybe after the first 20 minutes. Hero, you graduated from school at 13, and you did this, and blah, blah, blah. Our parents are dead, blah, blah, blah. You know, now that I think about it, Big Hero 6 has a lot in common with How to Train Your Dragon. That whole middle part where Baymax learns to fly... I might need to do a whole video on Big Hero 6. It's got some problems, but it's absolutely not on the worst list. Any movie with the end of the second act as meaningful as Big Hero 6's belongs on no worst list. Number 9. A Haunted House 2. It cannot be said that Marlon Wayans isn't willing to go out on a limb and look completely ridiculous trying to get some laughs. Like acting like a total moron and making love to that doll repeatedly, but... Like a lot of found footage movies, I have the feeling that they didn't have enough actually written before they started. It's just not that funny. Number 8. Under the Skin Am I stupid? This is the only one of this list that I didn't catch in theaters and I actually watched on DVD because I was intrigued. But did everyone else get a different movie? Was there a narration on the soundtrack you only get in 5.1 sound that explained why this wasn't boring? Did we all want to see Scarlett Johansson naked so badly we're all willing to put this film on best list so she'll do it again? I don't get it. I'd describe the plot, but I'd be surprised what other conclusions people could draw from what happens here if they didn't just go to Wikipedia and look it up like I did. The light version of it is it's about Scarlett Johansson and several men she encounters throughout Scotland, and if it wasn't for an interesting section in the middle featuring a disfigured man, I wouldn't have remembered a thing about this movie. I almost turned it off, and I almost never do that with movies I've rented. Lenny, I should have listened to your warning. I'm sorry. Number 7. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I guess it was all leading up to this. Do you know why I object so strongly to Star Trek being gutted and his taxidermied hide stretched over a spec script made by someone who writes scripts by filling a daddy issue's mad libs? Because when it succeeds, we get crap like Amazing Spider-Man and Ninja Turtles all dealing with the same old crap, the same issues of avenging your father, destiny, friends, and family, blah, blah, blah. The similarities between Amazing Spider-Man 1 and the This Ninja Turtles movie are shocking. If you didn't hate that one, maybe you won't react as viscerally as I did. For me, remaking Amazing Spider-Man 1 is like remaking Norbit. The most I can say about it is that Johnny Knoxville actually makes a pretty good voice for Leonardo. Otherwise, it's a total washout. Number 6. The Nut Job. Oh yeah, Turtles wasn't the worst Will Arnett movie released in 2014. This has an admittedly interesting premise. A squirrel wants to break into a nut shop that's actually the hideout for gangsters planning their own heist. This could even work with a main character that is very difficult to like. Not that most of the other characters are easy to like here. But this could only work if the script wasn't aimed at four-year-olds with all the flatulence humor and stupid nut puns and innuendo. It's simultaneously juvenile and coarse. It's a real tough set. Number five, Robocop. You know what? I never saw Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but... At least it has a different title, so you don't have to say, The Remake? Oh, you're just mad because it's not like the original. You know what? I haven't seen the original, except for maybe tiny little parts of it on TV, like years ago. But if it was this forgettable, I doubt it would have become a classic. That's like telling me Collision Course was a classic. I, Frankenstein didn't quite make the list, but was this worse than I, Frankenstein? It's bland and overly CGI'd action, but at least I, Frankenstein lived and died on its own. I know I, Frankenstein was a comic book before, which is probably part of why it got made, but that's not the only reason. The only reason this would even be remembered is because it claims to be Robocop, just like, I don't know, the damn Star Trek reboots, which take all the politics and metaphors of the time and turn it into an action movie that's actually pretty good compared to High Frankenstein. Like, the Total Recall remake was bad and dumb, but the action was okay. If Robocop wasn't called Robocop, it would be washed away in a sea of terrible science fiction action movies and dissolve it in nothing, because there's nothing interesting about it. Like... Robocop's suit in this one is silver at the beginning, I suppose as a reference to the original, and it looks way better than that shiny obsidian black he's clad in through the rest of the movie. He's so much easier to follow than the black one, who just f turns to a giant blur. It's like they're making the wrong decisions on purpose. Number four, that awkward moment. 
I don't like many romantic comedies, but this awkward moment is agonizingly contrived, trying to wring humor out of a completely avoidable situation these three unlikable jackasses have put themselves in. You'd figure, in a story constructed exclusively to make jokes, and with no relationship to reality at all, the jokes would be really good. But nope, this is the sort of movie where Zac Efron has to go to a dress-up party and dresses in a costume of rock out with your... out with a large silicone replica hanging from his fry representing the unit. And when he realizes, oops, it's a fancy party with formal dress, and then he accidentally dips the tip of the replica unit into his girlfriend's mother's drink and says, whoops, that should not have happened. Now it's a cocktail. That's what you were leading up to? This whole stupid torture scene was leading up to that joke? That joke was so good you just couldn't let it go? And then, after failing to make you laugh, and I mean even once, not once did I laugh at this movie, and as they demonstrate, this movie does not take place anywhere on Earth, then we get the second act breakup of the friends, the reconciliation, and the movie tries to be about their relationship. The relationships that we know are bought and sold before frame one of the movie even happens, and bear no resemblance to any normal human interaction. This type of romantic comedy is swiftly becoming my least favorite variety of movie of all. This awkward moment, along with numbers 2 and 1 on my list, were apparently on the Hollywood Blacklist, the list of the best unproduced screenplays. They were also all first-time directorial efforts. Maybe promising scripts just shouldn't go to first-time directors. Or maybe the Blacklist is a bunch of nonsense. Number 3. The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Okay, I had a migraine when I watched this. I had to walk it a few times to get cold water, so I might have missed some stuff. My brother filled me in on some of the details, but I swear, if I was eating Ambrosia with a winning lottery ticket in my wallet, I still wouldn't like this movie. It's totally disorganized and directionless. The story goes nowhere and in several directions, and it leads to an ending that everyone who knows anything about the comics can see coming, as the movie stumbles around for two hours and 20 minutes trying to get to it. I think the lack of care in the creation of this movie is represented by the three things towards the end. Mild spoilers, but come on, this movie sucks. And a lot of this was actually in the trailer. First, they seem to imply they're going to introduce other Spider-Man villains as just people using Oscorp technology, like the Vulture's wings and Doc Ock's arms. Like the Rhino. Did you see the trailer? Well, you saw just about every drop of footage of the Rhino. The shot where he swings the sewer lid around and deflects rockets in the trailer and hits the Rhino. That's the very last shot in the movie. When's the last time the last shot in a movie was featured in a trailer? They didn't do that in The Matrix and show Neo flying away. Spoilers for a 15-year-old movie. Second, the movie is followed by a slightly shortened scene from X-Men Days of Future Past, which also didn't make either list, but still pretty good. It's the scene where Mystique beats up all those guys in Vietnam. It's cut down to the point where the scene looks kind of badly shot, and it's actually a lot better in the real movie. This was apparently the agreement to let Mark Webb direct Amazing Spider-Man 2 instead of something for 20th Century Fox. When I saw the scene in the theater... I said, aloud. And what does that have to do with Spider-Man? Third, did you know that Shailene Woolley was going to appear in this movie as Mary Jane? But she got cut. I don't know how much screen time she would have had, but I defy anyone to tell me where she could have been slotted into this already completely overstuffed movie. Movies like this come out because the studio has no discipline. The only way they see villains emerging is if Oscorp builds more villains. Like, it's all an organized conspiracy. But with the out-of-control budget in a series allegedly rebooted because Spider-Man 4 would have been too expensive, and the complete lack of discipline during shooting and production, I haven't even mentioned Norman Osborn's frozen head. It makes me wish these movies were being made by Oscorp. Maybe they are as a means to discredit Spider-Man. I don't remember if the line, You know what I love about being Spider-Man? Everything is still in the movie, but damn, if that doesn't show in one sentence how little they understand Spider-Man. Number two, Bad Words. This one deserves a full video breakdown, so I won't go long. Jason Bateman plays a man who wants to disrupt a children's spelling bee for his own reasons. I might have laughed at least once during this movie, but that doesn't automatically mean it's a better comedy than that awkward moment. The post-hangover R-rated comedies have very rarely been as good or funny, but somehow managed to tap a neat... <clears throat> but somehow managed to tap neatly into the aspects that make them troublesome. Bad Words is like the perfect example of those problems. It's not a comedy in any real sense. It stars an evil, self-centered, and poorly educated man who is nevertheless smart enough to outwit everyone who surrounds him, get everything he wants without impediment, not the least of which is consequence-free sex, and gets to act like a total jerk and never face any consequences for it. This is not a comedy. 
It is a fantasy. It is a wish fulfillment fantasy for frustrated losers to watch, to get a vicarious thrill watching someone behave the way they wish they could, if only they had the courage. It is a hateful, miserable little movie. But it serves as a useful example. So it can't be the worst movie of the year. Number one. Transcendence. From its very first frame, Transcendence commits absolutely to expressing the simplest ideas in the most drawn-out and boring way imaginable. I wasn't crazy about Looper like everyone else, because at the end of the day, it's still the oldest time travel story in the world. Transcendence's story is, maybe mankind wasn't meant to do certain things, and that's the oldest technology story in the world. It's Prometheus, more so Frankenstein, who keeps appearing on this list despite the fact that I don't want him to. Oh, this particular application of this technology is an abomination, so bring everything down. When Transcendence doesn't bore, and boy does it bore a lot, it's stupid. World-altering technology, like the stuff you see in this movie, seems to have no impact on the outside world at all. Everything takes place in the same damn desert. When it's not stupid, it's annoying. Rebecca Ryan plays Johnny Depp's wife, and she's all for all the techno stuff he's cooking up in Lawnmower Man space, until she gets cold feet at a rather arbitrary threshold. And Kate Mara, look, I don't like ragging on actors on my show, but Kate Mara is the leader of the wannabe anarcho-primitivists that killed Johnny Depp in the first place, but if your character is going to be the leader of some terrorists, wouldn't you have some skin in the game? In every scene, she's completely flat and bland, like she couldn't care less. It's the worst performance in a movie full of good actors left completely adrift by a lazy movie. Christopher Nolan is the master of the seemingly meaningless opening shot, like the Polaroid developing in reverse and memento, the field full of hats in The Prestige, and the dust-covered toy rockets in Interstellar. And if you had a problem with Interstellar, this makes Interstellar look like... something that's better than Interstellar. Apparently, none of that rubbed off on Nolan's collaborator and first-time director, Wally Pfister. Here, the opening scene just about gives the whole game away. I object to this movie not because I don't like the message about technology, and that I believe technology is neither good nor bad, but how it is used that determines right and wrong. I object to the fact that, watching this movie, I don't even think that was the point of the filmmakers. I could not tell you what the filmmakers believe about this story or about the theoretical technology within it. Transcendence is a waste of time. It is a movie that nobody ever needs to watch. There is nothing to learn and nothing to gain from it. Thank you all for watching.